the planet Earth. From 100 miles up, it looks like a serene body composed of water and scattered land masses. But to all of us who live on the planet, we know all too well that living conditions are often anything but serene. This is a real-life emergency operation center. In fact, it's quite similar to the disaster control rooms I've been in in productions like Airport and Earthquake. You know, disasters, whether real or recreated, have always been a popular subject among moviegoers, like sex. It's been one of Hollywood's fundamental obsessions from the beginning. It didn't take long for filmmakers to realize that tragedies and calamities are great moneymakers. Audiences will come from far and wide to see the latest in catastrophes, Hollywood style. As early as 1920, director D.W. Griffith used the drama of a catastrophic ice flow as the suspenseful highlight of the classic Way Down East, starring Lillian Gish. Gish's hurtling to certain death on an ice flow provided great material for a valiant rescue against impossible odds. But director D.W. Griffith's determination to achieve realism almost cost the life of his leading lady, who nearly drowned when she was uncontrollably swept away. Although always fascinated with natural disasters, Hollywood holds a special place for man-made destruction. In the 1930s, the most popular serials, aptly called disaster makers, titillated their audiences with scenes of imminent cataclysm. In this scene starring John Wayne, the hero tries to prevent two trains from colliding head-on.
Mrs. Bell and Hurricane Express are going to crash. What are you doing? I'm going to try and sidetrack one of those trains. You can't make a landing here. You strike up the train. I've got to take that chance. Disasters didn't have to be based on reality. Even fantasies could have disastrous realism, as in the classic Lost World, in which a dinosaur destroys downtown London. By the early 1950s, moviegoers were confronted with dramatizations of our worst fear, nuclear war. In this early TV special, we have a look at the horrors facing America during an atomic attack.
Tune your standard radio receiver to 640 or 1240 kilocycles for official civil defense instructions and news. Once again, your attention, please. Your attention, please. This is your official civil defense broadcaster. An explosion has just taken place in New York City, which is believed to have resulted from the dropping of a hydrogen bomb. The bomb was probably carried by a guided missile launched from a submarine at sea. All civil defense workers report to emergency stations immediately. Stay where you are unless you're in immediate danger. Do not attempt to join your children if they're in school. They are being well taken care of where they are. Do not try to telephone. Remember, radioactivity may make food and water in open containers dangerous. Use canned or otherwise protected foods until further notice. Do not attempt to inquire about relatives in New York, as yet there is no information. We live in a world in which catastrophes are almost a daily news event. And disaster centers like this stand on constant alert. This room was especially needed in Southern California due to a threat we perpetually face, earthquakes. During this century alone, these movements of Earth have caused billions of dollars in damage and the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives. San Francisco, the year 1906. At 5.12 a.m. on April 18th, an 8.3 quake rocked the city by the bay, but even a greater catastrophe was to follow. The quake, which had ignited various fires, also soon ruptured the city's water mains. Small fires grew into a raging inferno that raced across the city. Firefighters blew up whole city blocks in a desperate effort to stop the flame. In all, 700 people died in the fire and earthquake, the greatest earthquake disaster in California's history. Homeless survivors set up tent cities in the Presidio and Golden Gate Park and slowly began to rebuild their lives. While almost everyone remembers the great quake of 1906, the 1933 quake in Long Beach seems almost forgotten. Yet it too had disastrous effects. This footage demonstrates how even a moderate quake of 6.3 can wreak havoc in a densely populated area, especially when buildings are poorly constructed on unstable ground. 120 people died that fateful day in Long Beach. This is the emergency food line in Long Beach, California, in Bixby Park. We have already fed in this line here the last two days over 25,000 people. This is in addition to over 50,000 people fed in the, in the emergency food line at Lincoln Park, Long Beach. And all together, we have fed over 25,000 people in this park here. Good Friday, March 27, 1964. Schools were closed and offices were open only a half a day. Most everyone was at home preparing their evening meal and getting ready for the weekend's festivities. But something was definitely stirring off the southern coast of Alaska. It was at 5.36 p.m. that the earth-shattering convulsion began. The ground surged in great rolling waves. As it did, Anchorage began to fall apart. Whole blocks of houses slid to and fro. Pavements burst open. Fissures, some as wide as 30 feet, opened and closed like a wild animal's menacing mouth sometimes swallowing people whole. In the port of Valdez, the shoreline collapsed all along the waterfront, flinging piers and buildings into the harbor along with millions of cubic yards of earth. In Valdez itself, foundations cracked, walls gave way, live power cables whipped about, and broken sewer mains sloshed refuse through the streets. But the earthquake's final blow was yet to come. A devastating series of seismic sea waves were gathering up strength. 
the tsunami, or tidal wave, swirled its devastation into the town like a sneaky burglar. Five hours after the quake, the waters noiselessly poured up the Valdez Narrows again and again, at half-hour intervals, continuing until 2 a.m. In 1971, a major quake hit the San Fernando Valley in Southern California. The most disastrous effects centered here in Silmar, where the quake ruptured gas lines and sewer lines and brought down buildings in less than a minute. Even as rescuers began to pick through the rubble in search of survivors, the dam holding back the Van Norman Reservoir threatened to break, endangering the lives of 800,000 people in the valley below. In the end, the dam held, but sections of the Golden State and San Diego freeways collapsed. Countless buildings were utterly destroyed and hundreds of victims trapped. Here, at Olive View Hospital, three people died. The quake completely devastated San Fernando's Veterans Hospital, where two collapsed buildings trapped over 100 patients and staff. Forty people died here. It just shook and shook and shook, and the wall just opened up. It scared the you know out of me. I ran to my bed and flopped on it, grabbed a hold of it, and held on. That's all I could do. We live on a very unstable planet. Changes occur with every tick of the clock. Over millions of years, as the continents have drifted apart and moved over the face of the globe, jungles have turned to tundra. Grasslands have evaporated into deserts. Though often a danger to its inhabitants, Earth's contractions and fumings are signs of an ever-changing planet. The ancient Greeks and Romans believed that volcanoes were the chimneys of tremendous underground furnaces tended by the god of fire. Still, little attention was paid to Vesuvius, the dormant volcano at whose foot were built the ancient cities of Pompeii, Herculaneum, and Stabiae. Then, on the morning of August 24th in the year 79 AD, a violent quake rocked the countryside and Vesuvius blew its top. When the sun finally rose on this disaster, the western slope of Mount Vesuvius had been blown away. Herculaneum lay under 60 feet of lava, and Pompeii lay under 20 feet of ash. The wonders of Pompeii were forgotten for centuries, until rediscovered and looted in the 1600s. Finally, in the 1860s, archaeologists began the painstaking resurrection of Pompeii. They found everything was remarkably well-preserved. 1,800-year-old loaves of bread were found in bakery ovens. The victims' bodies could be reproduced by pouring plaster into the cavities left by the hardened ash when their bodies decomposed. All in all, an eerie look into a disastrous past. More recently, the Hawaiian Islands have been the scene of numerous volcanic eruptions. One of the most active sites is Mount Kilauea, a volcano that has been continuously erupting throughout the years. Just in the last two decades, it has buried several thousand acres of farmland and destroyed nearby communities. Its ferocious power was captured here by a local cameraman.
West Coast residents have an imposing danger to worry about. From the Sierras to Seattle, volcanoes long thought to be dormant are showing signs of life. The most famous explosion in recent history took place in southern Washington. Mount St. Helens had been silent for 123 years. Then on May 18, 1980, seven days after seismologists noted her first earthquake, Mount St. Helens proclaimed her existence with a massive display of force. Within three minutes, she left 600 square kilometers totally destroyed. Twelve hours of ashfall blanketed the northwestern United States and southern Canada with over three inches of ash. It's reported that ash shot up 14 miles into the stratosphere and circled the globe several times. In all, 60 people were killed. Some were like old Harry Truman, who, with his 16 cats, refused to heed the experts' warning and demanded to stay in his lodge at the edge of Spirit Lake. His home and his cats were buried under several feet of debris. He was never found. Today, the area surrounding Mount St. Helens has begun to show signs of rebirth. Flowers have begun to bloom, and a solemn tranquility fills the air. Since the dawn of history, no other natural force has affected our development as much as our weather. Our food supply depends on good weather. Our buildings are constructed to withstand the elements, and our clothes protect us from it. But weather is plainly unpredictable, as anyone who watches the weatherman knows. And the power of nature has proven over and over that our best efforts seldom can protect us from its fury. April 3rd, 1974, 307 people died in 11 states, of which several were declared disaster areas. The tornado first hit Brandenburg, Kentucky, population 1,600. It was almost completely leveled with 71 deaths reported. Then it headed west. It crossed the Ohio River, veered away from Cincinnati, and headed for Hamilton County. In Xenia, Ohio, 35 were dead, half of the town destroyed. Then a new wave of tornadoes hit the south. Alabama reported 72 dead. Tennessee, 46. Indiana, 39. Georgia, 16. In Alabama, the injured poured into Huntsville Hospital. In a terrible twist of fate, the tornado then headed straight for the hospital, nearly destroying it but amazingly, sparing any loss of lives. For civil defense, civil defense, the city of Elmwood is requesting all possible assistance. It sounded like a big train whistle, and we were right underneath the front of it. I've, I've never seen anything like it, and I don't want to again. What can you do? We lost everything that we had. Well, it'll all work out, I guess. It's just too bad. There's an awful loss here. My, these people, I feel so sorry for them. 
tornadoes are not the only creators of havoc. On August 17, 1969, Hurricane Camille devastated the Mississippi Gulf Coast. After hitting Cuba, it came ashore near Gulfport, Mississippi, with 190 mile per hour winds and 20 foot storm tides. 149 died in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama's coastal areas. Then the storm's rains hit West and Central Virginia, killing 67 people and with 107 others reported missing. The flood virtually washed out the mountain towns. In 1972, floods killed over 122 and caused $2 billion in damage from Florida to New York. Hurricane Agnes swept north from Cuba and the Gulf of Mexico, causing 112,000 people to be displaced from their homes. The storm passed over Florida, where it downgraded to a tropical storm. It re-intensified over Georgia and the Carolinas, striking hard on Virginia. In Richmond, two-story buildings submerged as the James River crested at 36 feet, breaking a 200-year record. It's bound to be in here somewhere because all these are the houses that came from in this vicinity. They're all spread in here in this neighborhood. But mine was wrapped on the corner, not on even the street. Yonder! <laughs> that grave in yonder, that's mine. <laughs> the greatest destruction was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania where the roads were flooded and the bridges washed out. At Wilkes-Barre, the Susquehanna River topped 38-foot dikes. And in southern New York, 14 counties suffered from devastating flash floods. When man began to clear forests and raise crops and build cities, he opened a virtual Pandora's box. Not only did it leave the door open for the appearance of many pests, but on a much graver scale, it unleashed the arrival of many infectious diseases. The evolution of man is a tale of bittersweet victories. Improvement in hunting techniques and agriculture enabled humankind to multiply and spread into the forest. The parasite, who had previously made themselves at home among the population of wildlife, were forced to look for hosts. The most likely and unlucky candidate was, and continues to be, man. Today, at least 80 diseases are transmitted between higher animals and man, and most of these diseases are tropical.
By far, tropical Africa is the worst afflicted of all. Thousands die each year from the effects of such exotic diseases as malaria, typhus, cholera, and yellow fever. Their symptoms range from high fevers and diarrhea to jaundice, internal hemorrhaging, and sometimes coma. The human body's main defense mechanism is the antibody. Yet the efficiency of this system varies with one's general health and may be significantly undermined by malnutrition. In developing countries, the death rate from infectious diseases is anywhere from 20 to 50 times higher than in the United States. Malnutrition and disease form a most disheartening vicious circle. It is estimated that at least two-thirds of the world's population has less than enough food to eat. Of that, 50% suffer from chronic malnutrition. Not only is the quantity inadequate, but the quality of food is also nutritionally deficient and lacks protein. Famine may occur due to any number of environmental circumstances, such as crop failures, droughts, floods, and pests. But oftentimes, it is the tragic byproduct of an unjust social system, which makes a primary need, such as food, economically unaffordable. The debate over world hunger is charged with political undercurrents. Many argue that the underlying problem is a matter of the inequitable distribution of food and not one of the world's food supply. Is there a way to prevent such inhumane misfortune as the famine of 1984, which claimed the lives of tens of thousands of African citizens? There are many who say that the simple solution is to impose strict population control. But tragically enough, like all things human, there is no such thing as a simple solution for such a complex matter. While slowing the growth of population may diminish the demand for nourishment, it really does nothing to improve the condition of persons now alive who already cannot afford food. While disease and pestilence have caused their share of problems, there is no other creator of disaster greater than man himself. Throughout our history, we've been at war with each other, and we've made great attempts at trying to keep some order. But as often as not, there are those of us who refuse to live by the rules. And these are the results. The history of crime is truly the history of humankind itself, and in America, We've had our share of marauders and murderers, arsonists and thieves, just to name a few. You're packing around? No. Search the car. Well, what's he going to search my car for? What is he looking for? We're looking for a guy that's been peddling dope to school kids. We had a hot tip that he was in this car. In this car? Why, there's a thousand cars on a road like this one. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, if you were all right, why were you trying to get away? Well, I thought you guys were a bunch of stick-up men. A new breed of criminal was born in the 30s. They were the throwback to the days of Jesse James, just a little more sophisticated. They sported getaway cars and automatic weapons, and they came from the heartlands of America, just country folk at heart, brought up on the wild legends that movie westerns were made of. But by 1934, crime had really gotten out of hand, so the government declared its war on crime. Among the first to feel the vengeful arm of the law were Clyde Barrows and Bonnie Parker. The... Young and restless, they captured America's attention. 
They were absolute geniuses at getting through police nets and traps, always escaping almost miraculously. But they made lousy bank robbers. In their two-year career, they averaged $16 per bank job. Their young lives would abruptly end on one bloody morning of May 23, 1934, on a road near Arcadia, Louisiana. With Clyde at the wheel, the couple sped through the back country at 85 miles an hour and drove straight into a police ambush. 167 shots were fired. 50 bullets found their way. Barrows and Bonnie died with weapons in their hands. She was crumpled up in the seat, her head between her knees, and machine gun in her lap. He clutched his sawed-off shotgun, which he held while he drove. In the car, policemen found the couple's enamored arsenal. For many years after, Bonnie and Clyde's bullet-ridden car was showcased at state fairs for 25 cents a look. John Dillinger was the superstar gangster of the 1930s. He captured the public's imagination with his style and verve. His criminal career spanned a mere 11 months, but within that time, he and his mob robbed more than 15 banks, plundered three police arsenals, engaged in three spectacular jailbreaks, and fought their way out of police traps, murdering 10 men and wounding seven others in the process. This was public enemy number one, so feared by the authorities that when arrested in Chicago, he was captured by the Dillinger Squad, 40 officers permanently assigned to capture him. He was then escorted by 85 other policemen from plane to jailhouse. The 13-car convoy took him to an escape-proof jail in Crown Point, Indiana. It was a futile attempt but within a short time, the sly gangster would manage to escape. His apparent immortality was bolstered by journalists who propagated the story about a wooden gun escape. The real story involved his lawyer, a bribe, a prominent Indiana judge, and a smuggled gun. Dillinger's life ended just as swiftly as his criminal career began. On July 22, 1934, Dillinger decided he wanted to see Manhattan Melodrama a film about a gangster's murder trial. He would never make it home alive. On his way out of the Chicago Biograph Theater, he was met with a barrage of federal agent's bullets. He was killed on the spot. One bullet went through his left side, another ripped through his stooped back, and then came out of his right eye. Just as man's ability to create distinguishes him from other living creatures, so too does his uncanny capability to set off mass destruction. From early recorded biblical times through the Crusades, the Thirty Years' War, which destroyed nearly one-third of the population of Germany, on through two world wars, man has been responsible for the annihilation of millions of human lives. Many have studied the whys of war. Perhaps it has something to do with the first biological lesson of history, which is that life is competition. Or maybe we're like the lemmings whose ritual of jumping off cliffs en masse is a way of limiting the size of population. Whichever the case may be, no one can deny that war is definitely man's most traumatizing invention.
A display of emotion is all right. I'm not doing this deliberately, so please you believe me. I, I do believe you. Uh, a display of emotion is sometimes very helpful. Yeah, I hope so, sir. Sure, it gets it off the chest. Do you feel conscious, that is, are you aware of the fact that you are not the same boy that you were when you went over? Do you feel changed? In what way? Uh, um, more jumpy. How about with people? I used to. Hmm? I used to always like that fun. I used to always be going places. I don't like to come back no more. It was called the Great War, and as history would bear witness, it transformed the anatomy of war itself. The European wars of the 19th century had only been fought by armies, but it was World War I which mobilized all of the human and material resources available. It was the first time all of the great powers of the world were engaged in the same war. And it is estimated that by the end of the war, approximately 93% of the world's population was to some degree involved in the war effort. It was a grueling trench war with millions trapped in ditches dug four feet into the ground. Like prefabricated graves, the trenches entombed the soldiers who had died of gunshot wounds or poison gas. It was a war that marked the beginning of ideological control the cruel repression of public opinion and individual expression. It was just the dawn of the age of imperialism, international anarchy, and an unrestricted arms race. With the help of airplanes, tanks, and submarines, World War I executed more than 12 million persons and injured an estimated 20 million. It was labeled one of the bloodiest wars of history, with not a single decisive battle. But little did historians of the time know that just around the corner, there lurked an even bloodier and more brutal scene. It was another war to end all wars. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. World War II. This was truly the arena of worldwide destruction with every major power on Earth involved. There was jungle fighting street fighting, amphibious units, and death that rained from the sky. 50 million personnel and civilians were killed. All of the bombs dropped on all of the cities in World War II added up to approximately 2 million tons. When a nation is at war, the civilian population is rendered helpless in the face of such appalling aggression. The citizens of Dresden, Germany were no exception. A small town known for its fairy tales, spires, castles, and cobbled streets. It was totally destroyed in three massive air attacks during World War II. It was considered one of Germany's safest cities and had escaped bombing throughout most of the war. But on the night of February 13, 1945, more than 800 bombers left the city a burning inferno. The next day, 300 American flying fortresses came in to pour even more explosives into the flame and smoke. 
the monstrous firestorm produced 1,600 square acres of ruin. The death toll rose up to 135,000. It was the most catastrophic single aerial attack of the war. And once the war was over, the Allies were accused of purely flexing their muscles to show the Germans and Russians just what they could do. Some analysts categorized it as a deliberate terror bombing of little military value. But then again, the real terror bombing, known like no other, would fall upon Nagasaki and Hiroshima, Japan, just six months later. It was the A-bomb, which ushered in a new dimension of warfare. While it was initially intended for Berlin, its birth came too late. And so it was used on the second most favored candidate, the Japanese. The Hiroshima bomb burned out 4.7 square miles of the city with more than 130,000 dead or missing. Three days later, Nagasaki was hit with a bomb that made the first one already obsolete. This one obliterated one third of the city, annihilating more than 71,000 persons. While its citizens scorched bodies painfully withered and died, the Japanese government soon surrendered. Barbarism and an insatiable thirst for power were footnotes in this sordid chapter of history. General Eisenhower comes to see with his own eyes the atrocities in Nazi prison camps captured by the Allied armies. Accompanied by high officers, General Bradley, he goes through a slave labor camp in which Hitler Germans in mass murder killed thousands whom they could not take along in their retreat. Grim soldier General Patton has a look of horror as he gazes. These scenes inspire Eisenhower to summon members of Congress and high-ranking newsmen to fly to Europe for an inspection of Nazi atrocity camps to see for themselves. He orders German civilians to be compelled to come and look at the ghastly evidence, among them a Nazi officer who was a commander of the camp, so that Germans may know the hideous brutality of the Nazi regime which they have supported in war, an American soldier reads to them an official account of the mass murders and to make them realize the barbarities that they abetted, they are forced to go into a murder shed. Reluctant, the Nazi officer, a camp commander, knows well enough what he'll see. Go in with you, see the revolting sight of what your Nazis did. stricken with horror and with a realization of the punishment that they and their country deserve. Thirty-five thousand prisoners were murdered and buried here. Many are exhumed to prove cause of death. This haunt of Hitler crime was operated in the guise of an insane asylum. Autopsies show wholesale poisoning. There's a questioning of officials of the prison, a confession by the head killer. One exhibit is a bottle of the poison used. Questions are put to the prison doctor. He's asked about the murder of thousands of victims by poisoning. His response is clear. Typical of the centers of mass murder that General Eisenhower has summoned official witnesses to inspect. In these scenes, they obtain first-hand proof of the unbelievable barbarities of the Hitler regime of organized crime, which this nation and its allies have fought a desperate war to crush. American medical aid men labor to save the lives of survivors who were tortured, maltreated, starved. Pitiful wrecks when rescued, many dying as hands of mercy try to save them. This is evidence that world justice will not neglect in the punishment of Nazi war criminals. It's a procession of the living dead. German civilians are compelled to clean up the place of horror. Religious rites for the dead 
as they are removed by the people of the neighboring town, a kind of forced labor that the Nazis never planned. At this prison camp near Weimar, once called the Athens of Germany, many victims were beaten to death. In evidence, a club that was used, and bodies burned in a furnace. The anger of liberated slave laborers against Nazis. American prisoners of war, rescued after a bitter ordeal of ill treatment and neglect. Wounded in battle, they report inhuman hospital conditions. Their injuries, which are treated now, were given no medical attention, and they were starved, given scarcely enough food to keep them alive. We treat prisoners of war in accordance with the Geneva Convention. In contrast, look at these Americans. He was captured during the German offensive in December, was a prisoner for only a few months. Months of starvation that left him emaciated like that. These motion pictures are an expose of international criminality, the likes of which the nations dedicated to world peace must not allow to occur again. And as if these lessons of history were not enough, the United States would find itself mixed up in another grueling war just five years later. Dateline 1950. Place, Korea. This time it was the forces of capitalism versus communism, with the U.S. backing South Korea, along with 58 other countries, China and Russia, supported the North Koreans. In three years, about one million South Korean civilians were killed and several million became homeless. Approximately 580,000 United Nations and South Korean troops were killed, wounded, or reported missing in action. North Korean casualties were never publicized. The U.S. spent $67 billion. The battlegrounds were given names that soon caught the imagination of many. Pork Chop Hill, Bloody Ridge, Heartbreak Ridge. It was war at its goriest. While a truce was signed in 1953, the country remained fragmented, and charges of torture, starvation of prisoners, and other war crimes were sailed by both sides. By far, the most controversial of wars America has participated in was Vietnam. It began as a non-declared war against a subjugated French colony, and it ended as an embarrassment to all who cherish humanity. It was a war of attrition, of body counts, and the blind leading the blind. It was a sorrowful quagmire. Forests were defoliated with Agent Orange, and villagers were terrorized with napalm. More than six million Vietnamese vanished and more than 50,000 young Americans were either brought home in bags or never seen again. Warfare has traditionally forced mankind to make technological advancements which in peacetime have been used to improve the standard of living. One such invention has been the modern day airplane. And while I've starred in my share of airplane based dramas, real life airplane disasters are much more dramatic than any motion picture can illustrate. It has been a dream throughout history for man to be able to fly. A dream finally realized by the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk back in the early 1900s. The 360-foot flight would inspire a country to create an unprecedented pace of development in developing the technology of flight. With the advancements came risks of failure. And looking at these early machines, it's not surprising to see why.
One of the most remembered crashes took place at Lakehurst, New Jersey on May 6, 1937. The German-built dirigible Hindenburg was considered to be state-of-the-art in transatlantic travel. It had showers on board, a dining room with viewing decks, and 70 staterooms. With a giant swastika on its tail section, the Zeppelin was a powerful propaganda tool for the new Nazi government of Adolf Hitler. The formidable-looking craft was making its final landing at 7.20 p.m. against a stormy sky when the unexpected occurred. Sabotage, lightning, or an electrical short? To this day, no one knows what caused the explosion of the highly flammable hydrogen that filled the ill-fated Hindenburg, killing 13 passengers and 22 crew members. What we do know are Captain Ernest Lehman's final words before he succumbed to his burn. It must have been sabotage. Over the last 30 years, we've made tremendous strides in air safety and comfort. Modern day jets are substantially safer than their predecessors. But with tremendous number of flights and the size of the jets, accidents do occur. And when they do, they become unforgettable events. The most traumatic incident took place on March 27, 1977, in Tenerife, the Canary Islands. A Pan Am 747 and a KLM 747 collided on the runway, causing the greatest airtime disaster in world history. 581 people died on board the two jumbo jets, with scores of others injured. Man's technological advances were not only meant to conquer the air, but the sea as well. With our industrial progress at the turn of the century came marvels of science. Ships were finally considered unsinkable. One of these was the Cunard Line's Titanic. In this rare tour of the boat, just days before it left for its maiden voyage to New York, its captain gave a proud tour of his luxury liner. It left on April 12, 1912, and for three days it was a voyage without problems. On April 15th, the Titanic hit an iceberg, causing the unsinkable boat's rivets to seemingly pop out and flood the lower quarters. Over 1,500 people died that night. Only be a few years before the country would be shocked by another boat sinking. A neutral America bid farewell to the luxury liner Lusitania as it sped to war-torn England. On May 5, 1915, a German U-boat attacked the boat with torpedoes, sinking it and killing 1,198 passengers. The act angered Americans so much that they changed their neutral mind and declared war on Germany. The most recent ship disaster took place on July 25, 1956, when the Andrea Doria prepared to land in New York. Just off the eastern coast, 200 miles from Manhattan, Andrea Doria collided with the passenger liner Stockholm, the immediate blame being the thick fog that made it difficult to see. An immediate SOS was sent out with ships racing to the fast sinking vessel.
The greatest technological advance of the 20th century combined all we learned from air and sea travel. In reality, inventing the rocket took an enormous amount of trial and error. From Robert Goddard's earliest experiments to the first large rockets, failure was the rule. The space program finally took hold with a string of successes leading up to the invention and launching of the space shuttle. The size of a jetliner, the shuttle is capable of lifting a crew of seven and a payload into space. The shuttle, for the first time in history, brought us the promise of allowing regular space travel. The shuttle Challenger, like any of the technological machines before it, was an experiment in trial. It was built like its predecessors, but even more refined. But a combination of several features combined to make this mission the final one for a long time. Six astronauts and teacher astronaut Christy McCullough will always be remembered as pioneers who braved the greatest challenge and helped open up a new frontier. Big smiles today, confidently getting into the van. They're going to go out to that pad and uh, attempt a second try, second, uh, second try at launch today. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start, 4, 3, 2, one and liftoff liftoff of the 25th space shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower good roll program confirmed challenger now heading down range Engines beginning throttling down now at 94%. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104%. We'll throttle down to uh, 65% shortly. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles, downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Engines throttling up, 3 engines now at 104%. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity 2,900 feet per second. Altitude 9 nautical miles, downrange distance 7 nautical miles. situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We have no downlink.
have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. Contingency procedures are in effect. Uh, It's been less than 100 years since motion pictures were invented. And in that time, cameramen have made a permanent record of the power our environment holds over us. We're the first generation to be able to remind ourselves in such a graphic manner of the delicate balance of nature. If we listen to the warning signals and learn from the mistakes we've self-perpetuated, the films we've just witnessed will have done more good than simply entertain us. I'm George Kennedy. Thank you.